Okay. Well, the frame rate is a little slow. I'm going to assume that it works until it doesn't. Good morning. How are we doing? Any questions from our previous lectures? Are we all, all clear on the basics of reinforcement learning? Great. So today, we are going to talk about deep reinforcement learning, a very hyped up topic and, well, deservedly, justifiably. I'm going to start with a minimal Turing test. Do we all know what a Turing test is? Is there anyone who doesn't know? So, Turing test is a test of general intelligence or general artificial intelligence. Alan Turing, one of the fathers, well, one of the stepfathers of artificial intelligence, once wrote that if we can create a machine that during interaction with human beings can fool the human beings into believing that they are interacting with a human instead of a machine, we've achieved artificial intelligence. So here we have two players playing the game of Pong. One of them is a human player. The other is an AI is an AI trained by a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. Let's see if we can figure out which one's which. So the rules of the game of Pong are try to prevent the ball from hitting your side of the fence or the wall. Which one is an AI? You believe that it's left. Who else agrees with her? Is it the left one? And these are the scores, by the way. So the question is, which of these two players is an AI? How many of you believe that it's a left one, the one on the left? One and a half. I don't want to hear about pork, so it's too early in the morning. Um, how many of you think that it's the one on the right? Two believe that the agent on the right is the AI and the one on the left is human. One and a half of you believe that the one on the left is AI and the one on the right is human. Vic, I'm going to give you some time to think about this. One of this is an AI, another is a human player. Let's watch it for another 20 seconds. Even watching this gives me goosebumps. I think the left one is just too slow to pierce. And the right one can play the French and it's too difficult to get some background touch. But who's winning? Who's winning? Who has a higher score? The left one. So, so let's do the poll again. How many of you think that it's that the left player was AI? Three. How many of you believe that the right player was AI? One. How many of you don't know? How many of you don't care? Awesome. So you're right. It's the player on the left, but it was really difficult to tell. And that is the magic of deep reinforcement learning. We're going to talk about this topic uh, based on the slides prepared by David Silver. David Silver is one of the better known researchers in deep reinforcement learning. He teaches at UCL Univer University College London. 
and works at Google DeepMind. He was in the original team that developed the deep reinforcement learning algorithm that we're going to discuss today. So let's get to it, if we can. There it is. We know what RL is. We have a basic understanding of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a general purpose framework for artificial intelligence. What does that even mean? Well, reinforcement learning is for an agent with the capacity to act. That's one of the things we expect from uh, an AI agent. Each action influences the agent's future state. Just like us, when we do something, we change the state of the universe around us. And success is measured by a scalar reward signal. In a nutshell, just to summarize, the job or the goal of reinforcement learning is to select actions that maximize future rewards. Does that make sense? Can you empathize with an RL agent? Is that what we do as human beings? How many of you believe that this is what your brain does when you're thinking? None. How many of you think that this is not what our brain does? Bill and I don't remember your name, I'm sorry. Sarah. Sarah. Okay, why do you think that this isn't what our brain does? What if we represent damage with negative reward? Do you have a practical example in mind, something that has happened in your life and you've decided to go for the neutral option instead of going for the most beneficial or the least harm harmful one? Um, While you're thinking about it, Bill, no, you I disagree with this. I think there is unsupervised That's very true. So let's talk about decision making for now. Let's say that we have to choose between going right or left. We have to choose between, in the extreme case, the trolley problem. You are driving a car. The brakes are broken. It doesn't work. You can't stop the car. And you have two choices. Either hit a very sweet three-year-old girl or a very sweet 98-year-old grandma. When you want to choose between these two, when you want to choose between any set of options, can you think of any other fra framework other than maximizing your reward, which essentially is equivalent to minimizing your suffering as well? Any thoughts? Which one would you pick? Which one would you save? Awesome. So that maximizes your reward and minimizes your suffering of choosing, right? I'm not here to push a very, very controversial ideology. But what I want to tell you is most of our decisions, I am yet to encounter one that doesn't fit this. Most of our decisions, probably all, are based on or can be modeled with this notion of maximizing rewards and minimizing suffering. Does anyone know what this framework or ideology is called in philosophy? Rationality is more mathematical or economic. In philosophy, it's called utilitarianism. You can look into it later on. Many in the RL universe are firm believers in utilitarianism. 
those who go into the game theoretic analysis of it also come to believe that all of our morale, uh, all of our ethics and moral frameworks are also emergent from this maximization of reward and minimization of suffering, which are essentially the same thing again. What about the scalar bits? Success is measured by a scalar reward signal. I remember Vic was opposed to this last time. Do you believe that a scalar value is comprehensive and representative enough of the complex rewards that we receive in our daily lives? Can you always assign a numeric value to a reward for the amount of suffering that you get? How many of you believe that you can? How many of you believe that you can't? Okay. Any counter examples? So, first of all, it's just uh, mm -hmm. a sound of sparse issues. That's why it's important to get the user uh, for some real information. So, it's an issue of humor. It's not a model. Yeah. Um, that addiction thing was really interesting. For those who are watching this remotely, uh, Vic mentioned that when someone's addicted, they aren't really thinking clearly. They aren't thinking about maximizing future rewards. That's an interesting notion. I'm going to talk about this in a second. Bill, do you have a counterexample in mind? That's a very interesting uh, example. Can you, because it has multiple dimensions, right? There are multiple tasks that need to be done at the same time, and there are different rewards and different units associated with them. But isn't there a way to assign the same units of rewards to each? Let's say staying operational can be plus 10, and doing what it's supposed to do, a scanning around can be plus 20. Okay. I didn't really hear what you said, but I... Okay. Cool. So this is something that you want to think about. A lot of people in the AI community are firm believers in this hypothesis that RL is going to be one of the bases of AGI. Does anyone know what AGI stands for? Artificial general intelligence. The kind of intelligence that performs at least equally well as natural intelligence, our intelligence, in all tasks. It's adaptive, it's adjustable, it's self-organizing, it's self-learning, and so on. Some of you may think of the Matrix or the Terminator. I personally think of Jarvis and Hal. So this is a very interesting topic. Think about this, read about this, and then decide on your own. For now, we are going to assume, as we did in the very first lecture, that all rewards can be represented with a scalar value. We don't have to uh, revert or retreat to vectoral representation. Okay, so that was a basic in the, that was a primer into the philosophy of RL. I thought we had postponed it long enough. Quick review, agent and environment. We know that in RL there is an agent, there is an environment. At, F, at each step T, the agent receives a state ST, observes a state ST, sometimes fully, sometimes with noise or an incomplete view of the state, receives a scalar reward RT and executes an action AT. 
the environment receives the action AT, emits state ST, which means that it changes its state according to the action that it received and the internal dynamics of the environment, and emits the scalar reward RT. This is the model of the universe in the realm of RL. Examples of RL, we've already talked about this, but control is a very interesting area. Um, anyone here from electrical engineering? Anyone from mechanical? Anyone from any field of engineering that involves control systems? I've, has any of you ever done a control systems course? So the field of control theory is about creating or engineering a system that controls the flow or the natural dynamics of the environment such that it will lead to a desired result. Uh, like, let's say, you want to create a controller to drive a car. It has an objective. You want it to get from point A to point B and maybe secondary objectives while avoiding obstacles, while minimizing fuel consumption and such. And designing such a controller, fo controller falls under the domain of control theory. Uh, another interesting thing in control theory is the stability and all that. Uh, we don't want to dive too deep into this, but it's an interesting field. We have interaction in RL, uh, like in ad uh, companies or ad tech, advertisement technology, a lot of people are now using reinforcement learning for customization of advertisement. And even some of those robotic agents or chatbots that you use, a few of the commercial ones are trained not primarily, but secondarily on an RL uh, uh, algorithm. Solve logistical problems, scheduling, bandwidth allocation, elevator control, cognitive radio, power optimization, play games, which is going to be the focus of our talk today, and learn sequential algorithms, like attention, memory, conditional computation, activations. We already know what a policy is, right? A policy, Pi is a behavior function selecting actions given states. A deterministic policy is A equals pi of S. What's a non-deterministic or a stochastic policy like? Great. What do we call that? What's the stochastic equivalent of a deterministic function? Um, we are talking about uh, the equivalent of a function, not the process. How would you represent pi of s in a stochastic terms? Pi of s is a function. A function is a one-to-one -one mapping, right? Distribution. Distribution. That's correct. So the equivalent of this pi of s in the stochastic uh, realm is a distribution. You will have a certain probability for each possible outcome. That's what the distribution is. Value function, we know two types of value functions, V and Q. Can anyone tell me what the difference between V and Q is? I didn't hear what you say, but yeah, you were right. So, yeah, that works. One is state value function which tells you how good is the state that you're in. We decided to represent it with V. Another is state action value function, Q, which tells you how good is taking action A at state S. What's that pi over Q? Why do we say Q super pi? What would happen if we didn't put that pi in? What's pi? Redundant? Awesome. That's wrong. What's pi? Pi is policy. Q is always determined based on the instantaneous reward that you receive after taking action. Uh, there it is. 
after taking action A in state S, you will receive an instantaneous reward. And then the rest is what would happen if you followed policy pi. What happens afterwards is determined by policy pi. That's why we need to mention this policy pi here. Okay, now we talked about different types of RL. We know policy-based RL is searching directly for the optimal policy pi star. And what's an optimal policy? It's a policy that achieves maximum future reward. Value-based RL estimates the optimal value function, either V or Q star. This is the maximum value achievable under any policy. Model-based RL, build a transition model of the environment. Does anyone remember what model means? What is model? What are the components of a model? One is the transition dynamics, right? The transition probabilities. What's the probability of going from a state S to a state S prime if you take action A at state S? In physics, we call it dynamics. What the other component is the reward function or the reward distribution if it's not fully known. What is going to, what is going to be the reward of taking action A at state S and going to state S prime? These two, R and P, reward function and transition probability, represent the model of the environment. So, some RL algorithms are model-based. It means that they build a transition model of the environment. And then, when they have the model, they use planning algorithms to solve the optimization problem. What's the difference between planning and reinforcement learning? In planning, the model is known. In reinforcement learning, the model is not known. Can anyone think of a good example of a game that can be solved with planning? You need to know the rules of the game, and you need to know the rewards associated with each move. How about chess? With planning. Not all games. What what makes you, yeah? What makes you unable to solve a complex game? Exactly. So our brains are limited, as unlimited as they may seem after you wake up or you feel good or you pass an exam or whatever. Our, brain, our brains are constrained. We can't look uh, at an infinite time in the future. We can't completely and without any mistake model what's going to happen four moves ahead or five move, moves ahead when playing chess. I can't. Some of you may be able to do it. It's going to be really difficult for me. That's why some games, like the game of Go, are very complex, and you don't have an exact model of either the rules and the dynamics or the reward function. Now, speaking of complexity, let's talk about deep reinforcement learning. So, what's good about deep learning? What's so interesting and exciting about deep learning? Does anyone other than Bill have a good guess to answer that question? Yeah? Precisely. So one of the exciting things about deep learning or deep neural networks is the fact that they can infer a good understanding of which features matter. Let's say you want to train a robot to walk around using reinforcement learning, to navigate from where I'm standing to that point. If you want to do it the traditional way, you have to select a set of features that represent a state to the robot. You have to say, hey, look at your GPS coordinates. Look at your sonar readings and create 
an understanding of the obstacles. You have to give it the physics of the environment. You have to uh, implement the dynamics, the torque, the effect of gravity and resistance and all that within your implementation. But deep learning can on its own learn a very good representation of the environment from raw input. Let's say you only have a camera in your robot. That camera can receive the pixels that it observes and use deep learning to gain an understanding of the features that matter. Does it make sense to everyone? Do we know what features mean? Do we know what a feature is? Can anyone give me an example of a feature involved in walking from point A to point B? If you want to train a model to walk from this point to that door over there, what features should it look at? What features would represent the environment? Direction and distance. Is that good enough? Speed, acceleration, and mobility. Step size is a decision, right? Usually, it depends on the robot. What if there's an obstacle? What if there's a, I don't know, there's a 300 pound gorilla that's in the way? Would you want a gorilla to eat our precious robot? No. So it needs to have some sort of feature or understanding of an obstacle in the environment. Many, many years have gone by, and during those years, a lot of researchers have come up with manual hand-picked representations of obstacles in autonomous navigation. But with deep learning, those features can be easily learned from raw sensory input. You just feed your hungry neural net with a lot of examples of the environment. Sometimes you tell it this is in supervised learning. Sometimes you tell it, hey, this is what an obstacle looks like. And it learns over time how to distinguish obstacles from regular path or road. Now, let's assume the case of playing the game of Pong. One way to represent the world of Pong to an RL agent is to tell it the dynamics or the dynamical features of the ball, its direction, its acceleration, its mass, give it the physics of the environment, give it the position of each paddle, and something about the physics of reflection or the third law of Newton. That's very, very, well, even thinking about this makes me tired. Now, think about more complex problems, like autonomous navigation, like sweeping a room, like conversing with a human. In those cases, the feature space is so complex that even now, a lot of different fields of research from psychology to natural language to I don't know, image processing, are still trying to figure out exact or accurate models of the environment. But with deep learning, we can leave that understanding or that analysis and feature extraction to a neural net. That's where deep reinforcement learning comes from. That's how deep reinforcement learning is motivated. Can we apply deep learning to RL? We can use a deep network to represent either the environment or a value function, the policy function or distribution, or the model. Then we can optimize the value function, the policy, or the model end-to-end. -end. What does this end-to-end -end bit mean? It means that you don't have to do anything in between. You feed it raw sensory data, and it spits out an optimal policy or an optimal choice of action. You don't have to put a human being in the middle to... I don't know, design a model for it or correct a policy over time. And as with uh, convolutional neural nets and other types of neural nets, you can use a stochastic gradient descent to train it. 
Do we know what SGD is? Not if you've heard the term before. Watch the deep learning lecture. I think it was three lectures back. The Bellman equation. We talked about the magic of dynamic programming last time. I hope that you've read up on it. But as long as you can represent an optimization problem in a recursive form like this, you are able to use Bellman's formulation in dynamic programming to solve it. We know what optimal value function is. We know what value iteration is. We talked about it last time in the last RL lecture. And we know value iteration uses dynamic programming. You can see the recursive formulation here, QI plus one of SA, depends on what happened uh, before. Deep Q learning. So one part of it is to implant a neural net somewhere, right? Because deep learning reminds us of neural nets. Where are we going to implant that neural net? One way is to represent the value function by a deep Q network. So instead of saying that we have a Q pi of SA, we can say that we have a Q S A W. This W is the set of weights, is a vector of weights associated with the neurons in the neural network. What does a neural network do? Can anyone give me a five word answer to that question? What's the point of neural networks? What problem are they trying to solve in general? Any guesses? Why would we want to do that? What's the end goal? Let's, let's look at it from a higher point of view. Let's go up. What does a neural net do? Minimize the loss function. What's that loss function? What are we trying to do with that loss function? That loss function guides something. What is it guiding? A neural net is a function approximator. It's a very key point to note. A neural net is a function approximator. What does that mean? It means that in a supervised image classification problem, you want to approximate a function that given any input, it tells you what the output is. What's, a, what's Q? Q happens to be a function. Can we approximate it using a neural net? That's what neural nets do. And that's, oh, it says, there it is. That's how we represent a neural net approximation of the Q function. Sometimes instead of that W, you'll see theta, which is a more statistical function approximation uh, formalism. But again, so this means that we are approximating the Q function using a neural net with a vector of weights represented with W. Now, what's the objective function here? Let's say we want to solve a value iteration problem and learn the optimal Q function. The loss function is going to be based on the iterative formulation we had before. The instantaneous reward received this R plus the discounted max, discounted uh, value of QS prime A prime. This is the exact same thing that we had for the Bellman formulation minus what the current approximation or the current approximated value is. Do you see the sense in it? Does it make sense to you? I love your blank gazes. Ask. Some of you have watched Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If you don't ask the right question, the answer is going to be 42. Ask the right question. What is it that you are not understanding here? What is vague?
we know what a loss function is. It's something that tells us how far from the desired state we are, right? What is the desired state? I heard a few correct keywords, but I couldn't hear the whole thing that you said. Can you repeat it? You take an expectation. Uh, yeah. Along which you operate. The expectation is over cues or over this entire uh, algebraic summation and subtraction squared. So all cues go at both states and go at Q is for both. Do you remember the name of Q? State action value function. So it's an expectation on the expectation. Two relatively independent variable summarized with a dependent variable called Q. So Q is going to give you a number, right? Q can be your variable here. What we want to do is to minimize this iterative distance. Why is it a squirt? What I mean is your L function depends on the equation, right? Uh, you have uh, variables like S and Q, which are. Yeah. So I guess uh, expectation of the state of the X goes here. Why? If I dive into this, I'll lose about five minutes. I understand uh, what's going on there. Do you remember the process of training a neural net? If not, watch the deep learning lecture and it will be solved. So the idea here is at every iteration of training a neural net, you receive a new value for this Q and you either already have this value or you approximate it during training. And the idea is to optimize or approximate the best set of Ws that minimizes the distance between these two values. Um, watch the deep learning lecture, and if you have any questions, come back to me. I will be available. Yes. So you define that, 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 that thing on the right hand side is calculated for each state. It's, one of the it's calculated at each iteration for every state. So the idea is to approximate the Q function. Here or here? L. So you're right. You're saying that L should be S and W. You're right. You're completely right. But the reason it's omitted is because you already know that this L is being calculated for a state, a state action value function. You don't need to explicitly mention it. Mathematically, you're right. It should be S, A, and W even. Okay, so now that we have this, we can apply this gradient descent based on uh, a derivation with respect to W. If you don't know what gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent is, watch the deep learning lecture. It's really important for the rest of your careers in machine learning or whatever data science field you go into. It's really important to understand this. Now, let's say that we just do that. We just train a neural net to continuously approximate the Q function. That's not deep reinforcement learning. People have been using neural nets to approximate the key function since 2009 or even late 80s. There are a few problems here. One of them is naive key learning oscillates and diverges with neural nets for a few reasons. One of them is data is sequential. Why does that matter? Because successive samples are correlated, which means that they are non-IID. Can anyone remind us of what IID stands for? Precisely, yes. IID stands for identical and independent and identically distributed. 
Oh, boy. Bill, I, I'm going to need your help here. IID, ident independent and identically distributed. Oh, it's early morning. So, what's the problem with our data being non-IID? The problem is our neural net training algorithms use this assumption in function approximation in their training. So if you're using a neural net to approximate something based on the assumption that the data is, non, is IID, and then our data turns out to be non-IID, correlated with each other over time, then our model is not going to be accurate. It's not going to be correctly trained. Sometimes it doesn't even converge. That's a huge problem. And we know that the data is sequential, right? Remember from the basic definition of RL, the agent performs an action which changes the state, and that state is fed back to the agent, which again performs another action. Whatever happens is dependent on the previous state. There is a huge correlation between your time series samples. Another problem is, oh, come on. oh it died. Policy changes rapidly with slight changes to Q values. So, Sometimes, when you're approximating your Q function using a neural net, you will see that the resulting implicit policy keeps fluctuating very rapidly. It doesn't stabilize. Distribution of data can swing from one extreme to another. That's a huge problem because you don't, you don't have infinite time. And you know that dynamic programming guarantees convergence at infinity, right? So you have to stop it somewhere. Do you know where to stop it if it doesn't stabilize? Thank you very much. Stay calm. You don't really know because you have to stop it at some point, and that point can be very off where it's supposed to be due to this oscillation. And the scale of rewards and Q values is unknown. Naive Q learning gradients can be large and unstable when backpropagated. What do we mean by backpropagated? Watch the deep learning lecture. DQN, the algorithm, deep Q networks, proposed by Nih and others at DeepMind, solves all these problems with three interesting proposals. One, use experience replay. What does that mean? What's experience replay? We know what experience is. A memory of what we've observed. What happens in experience re replay, we'll go deep into this, but the idea is to create a bank of your previous or RL's previous observations, then at every training uh, iteration, a magical hands go into that bank and takes out a random batch of samples. And the assumption is the correlation should fade. If your bank is large enough, and your sampling method is statistically accurate, the correlation will be minimized, and you'll, you're closer to IIDness. The second idea for uh, mitigating oscillations, freeze target Q network. Remember we had this Q approximation and the new Q approximation. The idea in DQN algorithm is to freeze the first Q approximation to avoid oscillations. What do we mean by freezing it? What, what if our initial approximation of the second Q is wrong? We'll see how they fix that problem too. And then, with regards to the problem of scalar rewards and Q values is unknown, they propose a very simple clipping or normalization of rewards. So let's talk about experience replay. To remove correlations, build the data set from agent's own experience, which means when the agent takes action AT according to, epsilon, to an epsilon greedy policy, we don't need to go into that, but epsilon greedy is an exploration policy. Remember we had uh, exploration versus exploitation. Epsilon greedy is a monotonically decreasing uh, in randomness policy for exploration. The agent takes action AT based on whatever exploration policy there is. Then it, 
then the agent stores the transition or this tuple of the current state, the action taken at the current state, the resulting reward signal, and the next state in a replay memory D. Then the agent samples a random mini batch of transitions, all of these, from D. Then it trains based on this sample mini batch. Are we clear what experience replay is? Do we have any questions so far? Any questions? Do we, does anyone want me to go over this again? Okay. What about that fixed target network thing? What about that freezing thing? So to avoid oscillations, the DQN algorithm fixes parameters used in Q learning target. So in deep Q networks, in DQN, there are two neural nets with identical architectures. One of them represents a target. The other represents the flowing or the Q function that you're training for. We don't know what the target is in the beginning. We don't know what the uh, actual one is. Similar to training a CNN for image classification, we start with arbitrary values and then we optimize over time. The difference here is the target Q function is fixed for a fixed set of iterations. So in the beginning, let's say that the number of iterations is for updating uh, the target is 100. For the first 100 iterations, this bit, this gamma max A prime Q S prime A prime W is going to remain fixed while we change this and optimize for W. After the hundredth iteration in DQN, what happens is we stop, copy the weight values from this bit to the target network. And that's how you update the target network in DQN. So it's not frozen over the entire training period. It's frozen over a minimal or a set number of iterations. And it keeps getting updated, but not at every iteration. And that's how they fix the oscillation problem. Now, the reward value range. This is very difficult. They just clip everything to minus one and two plus one. So let's say that you are playing the game of Pong, the sample we were looking at at the beginning of this lecture. What you see is a score, 64 versus 51. The score, 64, is a reward signal, right? What they do is they clip or normalize every reward signal to the range of minus 1 to plus 1. This avoids convergence to infinity or even divergence and avoids massive changes in policy because, because of sudden changes in rewards. Um, and it ensures that gradients are well conditioned. If you go through the deep learning lecture, you'll understand what we mean by that. So the benchmark that DeepMind chose to test this algorithm on was Atari games. How many of you have played with Atari? Oh boy, that makes me feel so old. It's this device here with that kind of controller. This is an Atari, this is an Atari game. One of them, yeah. And this is the equivalent of this they have. So Atari, was the PlayStation or, I don't want to say Nintendo because Nintendo was actually a competitor, but Atari was the PlayStation of our time. Boy, that's ominous to say. Okay, so DQN in Atari, end-to-end -end learning, that's the idea of uh, deep reinforcement learning. End-to-end -end learning of values QSA from pixels S. So we want to 
only pass it the pixel values, nothing else. We don't want to tell it anything else. We don't want to tell it the model. We don't want to tell it the rules. We don't want to tell it the physics. We don't want to tell it what the reward function is like. But we can give it a reward signal based on the game score. Input state S is a stack of raw pixels from last four frames. Why? Why not just a single frame? Because we want to capture the dynamics. We want to capture movement, right? Imagine the game of Pong. There's a ball moving around. We want our agent to be able to understand movement. One way, one very difficult way, is to use recurrent neural networks like LSTMs to represent the time series data. A simpler way is to just give it four consecutive observations stacked together as a single in input, and thus it will understand the movement of the ball in those four observations. And the reward is changing the score for that step. And here's the architecture for the neural net use. Uh, you can see that it starts with an input of stacked frames, four stacked frames. Then you have a CNN. Again, watch the deep learning lecture. Convolutional neural nets are very well known for their uh, ability to analyze images. And we are giving it essentially images. And then in the end, you will have or you have uh, feed forward perceptrons, feed forward architectures, fully connected linear output layer and all that. And this is the architecture of the function approximator DQN uses to approximate the Q function. We can see the results. It's performing very well across a long and large set of a list of uh, different games. Now I want to show you a couple of demos. This is awe-inspiring. This is the game of breakout. The idea is for this paddler, this agent, to get as many of those blocks destroyed as possible while preventing the ball from exiting its fence or side of the game. See how it performs. Look at the strategy. So far, everything is normal. I wish I could play also as proud as Zarathustra. Something wonderful is going to happen here. That. I hope that you all have goosebumps by now. If you don't, there's something weird going on. Learning to do that is a very interesting and exciting sign of intelligence. And I want to show you another game. Um, this was trained using uh, DeepQ networks. And this is a game of Enduro. This is essentially a car racing game. And you can see that the agent has learned to move around at a supernatural precision. This game doesn't have a proper ending. It ends when you lose. The problem with what's happening here is, see, this is uh, the player's rank. It wins the game and never loses. So I was actually using this for a paper I was writing, and I wanted to show how it works when it ends. And it never ends. It always keeps winning. So that's the power of deep reinforcement learning. A few references that you might want to check. Deep reinforcement learning is very interesting. Almost all of you, from agronomy to geography to mechanical engineering to RCS guys, have multiple opportunities to apply RL and deep reinforcement learning in your projects. In agronomy, you have precision agriculture and controlling UAVs for monitoring crops and all that. RL is a very good tool to use there. Uh, you can use it for planning algorithms. You can use it for control. You can use it for conversational agents and all that. If you want to learn more, there is Berkeley's 
UC Berkeley's Deep Reinforcement Learning Bootcamp, which took place last summer. The videos and slides are already available, and these are very informative, designed for an audience with minimal background in ML and RL. Um, I'll put the link on Canvas later on. That's still Canvas? Yeah, I'll put it on Canvas. Another thing that you might want to check is UC Berkeley's Deep Reinforcement Learning course. Uh, I think it's still being offered by Sergey Levine. And there are a lot of guest lectures going on. And if you want to learn about the basics of reinforcement learning, go more into the fundamentals of reinforcement learning. David Silver's course is one of the best, but it's a little too mathematically involved. And a lot of my, some of my undergrad students who are working on reinforcement learning and a lot of my graduate colleagues have complained about the complexity of these lectures. Alternatively, on Udacity, there is a course on reinforcement learning by or from Georgia Tech, which is hands down the best course or MOOC on reinforcement learning I've seen. And it's for free. Dabble in it. You're going to enjoy reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is, in my very biased opinion, the way to our future. Any questions? All right, thank you.